So the next concept is the notion of resistance. So look again at Professor Gallagher's email data. Suppose the largest data value, 82, is replaced with the value 150. Recompute the sample mean and the median for the new data set. How does this change affect the mean and how does this change affect the median? So I have the data written up here in order, right? So we're gonna change this 82 to instead be 150. So my new data set in order is gonna be 54, 66, 69, 73, 75, 79, and 150. So again, I'm using 150 instead of 82. Now back on the previous page, we calculated our mean and we found our mean to be 71.1, but that was using 82 instead of 150. So if I change this and recalculate my mean now, if I add up the 54 plus the 66 plus the 69 plus the 73 plus the 75 plus the 79 plus the 150, and if we divide that by seven, because it was a sample of seven, well, 54 plus 66 plus 69 plus 73 plus 75 plus 79 plus 150, that equals 586. And if we take 586 divided by seven, that is 83.7 approximately emails. So how does this change affect the mean? Well, our mean when we calculated before was 71.1. If that one data value 82 is changed to a, a much larger data value 150, what happened to our mean? our mean increased from 71.1 to 83.7. So how does this change the mean? It went up by more than 10. What about the median? If I find the median having changed the 82 to 150, What's the median? The median is still 73. The median was not affected at all. So increasing 82 to be 150 really largely, hugely affects the mean. But changing the 82 to 150 doesn't affect the median at all. What I'm trying to get at is the concept of resistance. Resistance. So we have a definition here. A numerical summary of data is said to be resistant if extreme observations and an extreme observation is a very large or a very small value relative to what the values of the other data, uh, of the other values in the data set are. Anyway, if extreme observations relative to the data do not affect its value substantially. So the median is resistant. The median, when I had this extreme value of 150, instead of 82, the median was not affected at all by that. The median was resistant to being affected by that extreme value, but the mean is not resistant to extreme values. The mean is affected by extreme values. Our mean, changing that one value to an extreme value, made the mean jump from 71 to 83. So the mean is not resistant. So as we go through this class, we're gonna have a bunch of different kinds of statistical calculations. Some will be resistant, some will not be resistant. And we have to know 
whether our calculation is going to be affected substantially by extreme values. So we have to worry about that. And so um, it's something that we're going to need to keep in mind. Pretty much any time we learn a new statistical calculation, there's always going to be like positives and negatives that go with it, especially when we have uh, multiple statistical calculations or, or summaries that do the same kind of job. So the mean, the median, and mode all do the same kind of job. They measure the center of the distribution of data. And so uh, the reason why there are multiple computations typically is because there are positives and negatives to both. So again, the positive of the mean, for example, is that uh, it actually ends up working really well when we do inferential statistics. So we can do things with the mean for inferential statistics that we can't do with the median. But a negative of the mean is that it is not resistant. But again, the positive is that the mean is more useful for inferential statistics. The median is resistant, that's a positive for the median, but a negative of the median is that it is not as useful for inferential statistics. So oftentimes we'll give more than one of the measures. Now thinking about this a little bit further with the mean versus the median. If we have a distribution that's skewed left, the mean is generally going to be substantially smaller than the median. If we have a distribution of data that is symmetric, so like bell-shaped or uniform, the mean will roughly equal the median. May not exactly equal, but if it's a, if it's a symmetric distribution, again, meaning either bell-shaped or uniformed, then the mean and the median will be approximately the same value. And if our distribution is skewed right, then the mean will generally be substantially larger than the median. So this is just a visual of that. So like here we have a, a skewed left distribution, the tails on the left. So if that's the case, the mean is going to be over here and the median is going to be over here. So the median's kind of better placement in the center and the mean's gonna be skewed to the left of that. It's gonna be pulled down. If I have this bell-shaped distribution, then the mean and the median are going to be approximately equal. If I have a skewed right distribution, then the median is going to be here and the mean is going to be pulled to the right by the few large values. And so the mean is generally going to be bigger than the median in that case. Now, there can be some really bizarre exceptions to this, but as a general rule, these statements are true. Note, if a distribution of data is skewed, then we will report the median as the, quote, better measure of central tendency. If the distribution is bell-shaped or uniform, then we will report the mean as, quote, better. So you're going to be asked this. You're going to be asked which is better to describe the measure of center. Is it the median or the mean? And the way you're going to tell is by determining whether the distribution is symmetric or skewed. And so again, if it's a skewed distribution, then we're going to say that the median's the better measure of center. If it's a symmetric distribution, then we're going to say that the mean is the better description of center. Now that's gonna be our standard in this class. To be honest, we could debate that in some circumstances, but that's going to be our general standard. So, another example, we have all heard of the Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone National Park. However, there is another less famous Old Faithful Geyser in Calistoga, California. The following data represent the length of eruption in seconds for a random sample of eruptions of the California Old Faithful. So this is how long the geyser erupts. So one time the geyser erupted 108 seconds, another time 102 seconds, another time 103 seconds, another time 110 seconds, and so on. Okay. Does that mean? So we're supposed to determine the shape of the distribution of length of eruption by drawing a frequency histogram. We're supposed to find the mean and the median. 
and which measure of central tendency better describes the length of the eruption? So that's really our question. Is the median a better description of center or is the mean a better description of center? Now I'm going to show you how to use technology to calculate the mean and the median. So I'm going to show you both the calculator and I'm going to show you StatCrunch. Unfortunately, I wasn't uh, thinking and I did not enter this data into my calculator before class, okay? So I'm going to um, have to type that in real quick, okay? So bear with me just for um, a minute here while I type these data values into my calculator. Um, and in case you don't remember, I'm going to stat and edit to get to the lists. I just cleared all the data out of my list from before by, by highlighting the L1 and hitting enter, or hitting clear and then enter, I should say. That clears all of the data out of my list. And I'm gonna, again, just take a, a minute here to type this in real quick. So once I have the data in, I'm gonna do second and quit to get back to the home screen. Now, I showed you that we could draw a histogram of data using the calculator. And so I'm going to do that. Before I do that, I wanna find the smallest and the largest values in this table. I see a 90. Was there anything below 90? I think 90, we have two of them. I think 90 is the smallest value. Again, we had two of them. We have it there too. Um, I don't think there was anything below that. And the largest value, there's a 116 right here. Was there anything above that? Oh, there's a 120. So I think 120 is our largest data value. So I wanna construct a histogram from 90 to 120 for our data. Um, and so I need to figure out what a class width should be. Um, 90 would be a good value for the lower limit of the first class, and then maybe I would use a class width of, uh, like if I use 10, it would go 92 just before 100, 100 to just before 110, 110 to just before 120. So that would only give me like four classes. So maybe I'll use a class width of five or something like that. So I'm going to go to stat plot. I'm choosing plot one, turning it on. I have the histogram option selected. My data are in list one, and blue is a perfectly fine color. I'm gonna choose a window. So I'm gonna start Y min at 90. Y max needs to be at least 120 or a little bigger, so I'm gonna use like 125. My class width needs to be five. Y five, I just decided I was gonna use five. We have 44 data values here. So if I use Y min at zero and uh, Y max at 20, I think that'll be pretty good. Now, again, I don't really know what I need to use for Y max. I just need Y max to be higher than the largest frequency, but I don't know what the largest frequency is yet. So usually my first attempt is like about half of the data values. So we had 44, so I chose about 20. If I hit graph, there's my histogram. Again, if I trace, just to point this out, that last bar right there is really going from 120 to just before 125, and the 120 is in that class. Now, again, I could possibly use other things, like I could use a class with the four, and that's going to maybe change the shape a little bit. Let me just do that just to, to see. If I make the class with four, I get this shape. So what's the shape of the distribution? Bell-shaped? Definitely this looks bell-shaped. Um, when I used the class with the five, it wasn't as bell-shaped because we had this sort of weirdness over here. These are shorter, but I would say probably a bell shape is the best description. Now, does that make that 100% absolutely the correct answer? Well, maybe not, right? In real practice, there's debate. So. It's debatable. It's definitely not uniform. I could understand an argument maybe for skewed right a little bit, but really I don't think it's significantly skewed right. Bell-shaped is probably the best description.
when you're working on the homework, you're going to have some scenarios where it's debatable. If you get an answer marked wrong, you know, maybe you say it's bell-shaped and the problem saying it's skewed right or something like that, but it's a little debatable, send me an email and I will look at your answer, you know, explain to me in your email why you thought it was, say, skewed right, but it was counted wrong. And if I agree with you that it's debatable and it could maybe go the other way, I'll give you credit for it. So don't be frustrated by, you know, if you said this was skewed right and I said it was bell-shaped, well, there is a little bit of room for debate. Now, there are wrong answers. Let's be clear. If you said skewed left on that, skewed left's wrong. If you say uniform, uniform's wrong. But there could be some debate occasionally. So now I want to find the mean and I want to find the median. Well, I already have the data entered into my calculator, and I have it entered into list one. So on your calculator, to calculate the mean and the median, there's more than one way of doing it, but here's the simplest. Go to the stat button, same place you go to enter the data, except instead of choosing edit, go over to calc. So what we're going to do is this first option, one variable statistics. Now what that means is, first of all, we have one variable. We have this eruption variable. So that's why we're using one variable statistics. And the calculator is going to do a whole bunch of different calculations at once and display them for us. And we can pick out what we need. So I'm choosing one variable statistics. Now, when I choose that, I get this window because I've got a newer calculator. If you have an older calculator, you will not get this window. If you have an older calculator, you're going to get the one var stats it's going to say that on your home screen. Now what I do is I have to tell the calculator which list has my data. Well, my data is in list one. So I tell the calculator that's where the list is and I choose calculate. And I'm gonna do that in just a second. If you have an older calculator where this comes up on your screen, you also need to tell the calculator where your data are located. So if you put your data in list one, you would put L1 behind that, and then you would press enter. So one of our stats, tell it where your data is, which list, and then press enter. When I choose calculate, it's gonna calculate that for me. So look at what I get here, okay? I get all kinds of stuff that the calculator does for me. The first thing that it tells me is X bar. X bar is 104.1363636 and so on, so on, so on. If I round that to the nearest tenth, then I would get 104.1. So that is my X bar, 104.1, and that is seconds. So based on this data, on average, the California Old Faithful erupts for 104.1 seconds. Now, it also gives me lots of other stuff that we'll discuss as we go through this class. The second line there has sigma x. So what that is, that's what you get when you add up all of the data values in list one. These other things we'll talk about later. N equals 44. That's the number of data values we had. So the 4582 divided by 44 is where the 104.1363636 comes from. It also tells me the minimum value, that's the smallest data value, was 90. These other things we'll talk about later. By the way, that arrow right there means there's more stuff down the screen that's not displaying. So if I hit the down arrow, I can see the other things. And in included in that is the median. The median equals 104. And it also tells us what the largest data value is. And the largest value was 120. So it gives us a lot of stuff that we haven't talked about yet that we'll talk about later. I guarantee you, you are going to want to use technology to do the calculations. 44 data values isn't that many values, but if I tried to find the median, I'm going to have to put all of those in order, 
to do that. And that's time consuming and there's a good chance I'm gonna goof up. So technology is going to help. If you use your calculator again, double check, because if you have any typos in the data, that's going to mess up your calculation. So since we have a bell-shaped distribution, We've got the mean, we got the median. Notice that the mean and the median are approximately equal, which is again an indication of a bell-shaped or a symmetric distribution. Which measure of central tendency better describes the eruption? In this case, we would say the mean is better. And the mean is better because we have a bell-shaped distribution. Let me also show you StatCrunch real quick while we're here. Now I've shown you StatCrunch on how to construct histograms, but we haven't done any statistical calculations yet. So if I want to calculate the mean and the median for this data, then I can do that by going to stat. And what we're going to calculate is called summary stats. So summary stats are statistics that are summarizing our data. Now, when I point at summary stats, I get a bunch of options over here. What we're typically going to use is the first option, columns. My data is in a column. So I'm going to choose columns for that reason. If I had data in a row, which we're never going to have, but I would then choose rows. When I select columns, I get this window. So like when we did the graph before, we didn't graph this before, but when I showed you how to graph histograms previously, the first thing we have to do is tell StatCrunch where's the data. So the data is in this first column, which we've labeled length of eruption. By default, a bunch of different calculations have been selected over here. You see those in blue? There are other calculations that we can find as well, and we'll talk about those later on. But the main things, basically the same things that have been calculated on the calculator are set by default to calculate in StatCrunch. So otherwise, you choose what calculations you want to be done. So all I have to do is say compute. When I say compute, I get this window that displays a lot of information. Among them, we have here the the number of data values, 44. We have the mean, 104.13636 and so on. We have stuff we'll talk about later on. We have the median. The median is 104, the same thing we got with the calculator. We have the smallest data value, the min. We have the largest data value, the max, and so on. So again, I could use StatCrunch to find quickly that the mean is 104.13636 and the median is 104. And again, I could create a histogram I could create a histogram to verify, yeah, that's essentially a bell-shaped distribution, and so the mean is the better description. So on the next page, I did provide some instructions on how you can use the calculator and StatCrunch. Again, I just took these from the book but these are instructions on how you can use the calculator and StatCrunch to find the mean and the median, among other things. The mode. The mode of a variable is the most frequent observation of the variable that occurs in the data set. A set of data can have no mode, it can have one mode, or it can have more than one mode. So um, it, if all of the data values occur only once, then you don't have a mode. That's a negative of the mode. If you have two data values that occur the same number of times, and that's more than any of the other data values, then you could have two modes. You could have three modes. You could have four modes. Usually, if you have a large set of data, you'll probably just have one mode, but it all just depends. So again, three measures of center, mean, median, mode. There's positives and negatives to all three. So usually we'll use the mean because that's statistically, when we do inference, that's the most useful one. But it's not resistant, that's the negative. The median's resistant, but it's not as useful in inferential statistics. The mode, relatively easy to find, but it's not as useful statistically, and we may end up with situations where we have more than one mode or no mode. So again, positives and negatives to all three. 
Example, the data below represent the final exam scores of 12 students from statistics last semester. Find the mode. So I have 12 data values, so I need to find the mode. So all I'm doing is finding which one occurs more than the others. So if we take a look, I've got 62, that only occurs once. 94 only occurs once. 81 occurs twice. 78 occurs one, two, three times. So, so far 78's got it. 83's only occurring once. 78 we already said three times. 65 only once. 81 occurred twice. 93's occurring only once. 89, there's 78 again. 82's only occurring once. So our mode is 78 because that is occurring three times. It's occurring more than any of the other times. One way you might go about finding the mode, um, you could sort the data and put it in order, and that would help you identify when you have more than one, for example. You might also make a table and do tally marks or something like that to figure out what occurs most frequently. If no observations occur more than once, then the data have no mode. For example, Professor Gallagher's email data has no mode. So if I go back and look at the email data from the previous pages, there those data values each occurred one time, so there wasn't a mode. Again, that's a negative. If a data set has two modes, we say that the data are bimodal. If a data set has three or more data values that occur with the highest frequency, we say the data set is multimodal. So if it's two, we usually call it bimodal. If there's three or more modes, we just say multimodal. The mode is usually not reported for multimodal data because it's not representative of a typical value. The whole point of finding a measure of central tendency is we're kind of finding what's happening on average, what's typically happening. So the mean and the median give us that description. The mode does too, unless it is multimodal scenario. Figure A shows a distribution with one mode. Figure B shows a distribution that's bimodal. So if you have one mode, that mode's typically going to occur in the center. If you have more than one mode, it's going to be sort of like this. You're going to have two sort of humps generally. One advantage of the mode is that you can find the mode even when you have qualitative data. You can't find the mean or the median of qualitative data or nominal data, but you can find the mode of nominal data. So that's a benefit of the mode. So we cannot find the mean or median of nominal data, but we can find the mode. A sample of 100 registered voters in the city of Naperville were asked their political affiliation, Democrat, Republican, or Independent. The results are shown to the right, find the mode political affiliation. So if I wanted to find the mode, I just have to figure out what's more frequent, Democrat, Republican, or Independent for Naperville. So the mode for this nominal data, this qualitative data, I'm gonna to have to just count. How many Democrats are there? How many Republicans are there? How many Independents are there? So I'm gonna just run through real quick. So there's one Democrat, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46. So I got 46 Democrats out of the 100. I'm guessing that's probably going to be the mode. Republicans, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. So we had 38 Republicans. 
And so the rest should be independents. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So we had sixteen independents. So the mode is Democrat. 